Welcome to our Summerlin Church video this week. I'm so glad you're here. We're taking a look at the spiritual practices of Jesus. What were the spiritual practices or emphases that Jesus walked through in his own life that drew him closer to God? And how can we, as those who are seeking to live and to love more like Jesus lived and loved, how can we practice those same spiritual disciplines to deepen ourselves in the love of God? It's been an exciting thing to look at. We've looked at a couple over the first couple weeks, and today we're taking a look at something that Jesus anchored his life in, not just his spiritual practices, but when he woke up every day, Jesus knew that he was anchored in what he called the will of my Father in heaven, or what else he called the will of him who sent me. He used this phrase multiple times throughout his life and ministry, and we get it recorded in different examples. So when he woke up in the morning, Jesus thought this thought, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He thinks of this every day. In another place, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So what's Jesus mean when he says will? What's he talking about? He's talking about the desire of God, but this is a packed term. So we'll take a little bit of time to unpack it, and then we'll take some time to use it the way in which Jesus used it in a couple of different examples. Jesus told us a story. What's the will of God? Well, he was sitting around and talking to some uh, church folk. They were people who were religiously observant. They were the ones who were coming to, to gather to worship God together. And he's sitting around and he's talking to them. He tells them this story. He says, there once was a father with two sons. This isn't the one you're thinking of. This is a different story. There once was a father with two sons and the father owned a vineyard. And he said to the first son, I need you to go work in the vineyard for me today, son. And that first son says, sorry, not today, and goes on his way. But later, he actually comes back and works in the vineyard, just like the father had asked. In the same way, the father goes to the other son and says, I need you to work in the vineyard for me today. And that son says, sure, dad, I'll go do that. But then he doesn't. As Jesus looks out at those assembled, listening to this story, he says, look around. You all are, are checking off the religiously appropriately observant boxes. But if you don't change your minds and believe, if you don't actually change your lives according to the will of God, then those who you have written off, those, uh, the money extorters, the tax collectors, the, the prostitutes, they're actually going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. When I hear Jesus tell that story, I'm thinking, well, I would be the one who's sitting around that church gathering. I'm the one at the Bible study. I'm the one there on a Sunday morning. I'm the one in the small group. And if Jesus shows up to our gathering and he looks around at us, and says, well, you didn't change your minds and believe. I want to be the kind of person that says, Jesus, help me change. Help me change to become more like someone who lives into your love by living the will of him who sent you, of your Father in heaven. Well, Jesus unpacks this will in other places, in the Sermon on the Mount, he mentions it a couple of times. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' great um, collection of teachings in Matthew from verse five to, or chapter 5 to chapter 7. And in this collection of teachings, he uses this word a couple of different times. This one, uh, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's God's strong desire that we are all gathered up into what Jesus unpacks as the kingdom of heaven. But it's those of us who are doing the will that will have the keys to unlock that entrance into the kingdom of heaven. But I want to be clear about something. Doing the will isn't actually starting with doing things. As humans, we are so easily saying, okay, give me a checklist and I'll check them off, I'll do it. 
The will of God begins with a relationship with God. The will of God begins with listening to God's voice. The will of God begins with time spent, invested in deepening in just knowing God. Knowing God as this loving Father. The will of God is incredibly good news. One thing that we can get confused about is when we talk about the will of God, we can say, oh, well, this is actually a really hard thing, or it's a burden that's too big to bear. Well, the anchor of the will of God is that God is embracing you. God is giving you a big hug and saying, welcome home. The will of God is to invite you in. And that's where it starts. It starts with hearing that call. When Jesus is, is teaching in his hometown, some people come up and say, oh, well, your mother and your brother and sister, there, your family's here. And we get this in Matthew chapter 12. And um, Jesus looks and says, well, for whoever does the will of my Father, whoever's doing the will of my Father in heaven, they're actually the ones who are my brother and my sister and my mother. And later on when Jesus is talking another story about one sheep that gets lost, there's 99 and we know where they are, but there's one that's lost. Jesus says, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that any one of these little ones should be lost. It is the will that every one of them is found. So if we look at what Jesus means by the will, we can essentially throw it into two categories. We can talk, throw it into a, a God-centered category. What is the will of God from a God-centered perspective? It's saving. It's bringing everyone in. That's why he sent Jesus. God said, I want every one of my sheep around the master's voice. I want this good shepherd to bring them all home. And on the other side, the will of God from a a disciple-centered perspective would be sanctifying. It'd be that journey of living more like the love of Jesus. So we've got a a saving component. We've got a sanctifying sanctifying component. And what we're saying with that is, is, well, by doing the will of God, we are actually practicing these practices that Jesus talks about. When Jesus uses... Uh, the word will in the Sermon on the Mount, um, I think we could define the Sermon on the Mount within, or sorry, define the will of God within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount to teach your will be done, to teach us how to pray, we could essentially say your Sermon on the Mount be done. As we enter into this journey of living deeper into the love of of Jesus, we're really living into the will of God for our lives. So that's what Jesus thought. That's what Jesus thought when he woke up in the morning and said, I have come down to do the will of the one who sent me. And this is what Jesus taught. This is what Jesus taught us about the will of God or the desire of God. But I think it's most important at this point to take a look at what Jesus did. How did Jesus actually take this concept of the will of the Father of heaven, the one who sent him, and actually practice it in his life? And how can you and I do that in the exact same way? Well, he gave us a prayer. He gave us a prayer that's been described as the most honest prayer we have. It's four words long for you. Who are interested in memorizing scripture, uh, if you're like me and you want to memorize short ones, here's one to memorize. Four words. You likely already have it. When Jesus taught us to pray, one of the phrases he taught us was, your will be done. But it wasn't just what he taught us, it's also what he practiced. If we look at one of the deepening moments of Jesus' spiritual practices, if we look at his life from beginning to end, Right before his crucifixion, he has this last night with his closest friends. They share a meal. And then he goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And it's there in that evening of prayer that he is in anguish. 
his friends fall asleep. He's seeking the heart of the Father. And he practices exactly what he preaches. He says, your will be done. He's internalized that prayer, the Lord's prayer that he gives us. He prayed that type of prayer so often in his life. As he teaches us to pray for our daily bread, I take that to mean we say that every day. So if he's saying that prayer on a daily basis, he was living into the will in the everyday things. But then also at this crisis point in his life where he's facing the most challenging thing he's up against, walking forward into his own execution. It's out of those daily, routinized, almost miniature practices that he's conditioned for the major, upsetting, difficult practice. As simply as we would say, thank you, God, for this food, and your will be done on a daily basis, right before his crucifixion. He says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if this is the way it has to happen, your will be done. Your will be done. If we enter into that shadowy garden with Jesus that night, we know that in the midst of this prayer of relinquishing, it's painful. It can be very painful. I said earlier, the will of God is good news, and it is. And on a daily basis, when you pray your will be done, it's, it's prayed with a smile. Because God's will for you is anchored in a deeper perspective. It's anchored in time beyond our imagination. It's anchored to a bigger goodness that you or I could ever know yet. So your will be done is actually said with delight. But I do want to acknowledge how painful it was for Jesus that night and how painful it can be for you and me to pray this. At the end of the talk, I'm going to take some time for us actually to pray together. So as we, we step into that, I ask you to consider one thing that you would like to relinquish and put into God's hands and say, God, your will be done. So think about what that one thing is right now. And I acknowledge that this is hard. By definition, relinquishing this to God's will means that there is a loss of control. In many cases, there's even a loss of self. You're also inviting yourself uh, into undesired outcomes. It's not what you want. And if we compare that short list to what it meant to Jesus to pray this in that garden in the shadows in Gethsemane that night. If we understand what it was like for Jesus to pray, your will be done, we knew for him it meant loss of not just self, but loss of life. It didn't just mean loss of control, it meant loss. It meant extreme pain and isolation. These were some of the undesired outcomes for Jesus. But, what is gained? While acknowledging what's lost, I want to focus on what is gained by praying, your will be done. Well, in the daily practice, we gain the daily rhythm of living into God's will. So those are the little things. It's like daily bread. But in the exceptional and the monumental and the major things, things like um, losing a job or letting go of a loved one to death or honestly placing a child 
into God's hands, a wayward child or a young child? What is gained in the midst of this? Well, we gain trust. That is the fundamental thing that you and I gain as we lean into this. We also gain openness and focus. We gain the identity of learners, just like Jesus called his disciples, ones who are learning. We get to be learners. And we're invited into God's perspective. I don't know if you spent much time in uh, office buildings over the last few years, but there was a craze, I don't know, five, ten years ago, word clouds. You remember, you may have seen them online as well. Basically, if you unpack something, what are all the words that people are saying about this? So, you know, if, if you come work for our company, sometimes a company will have a word cloud on the wall that said, these are the people that work for us are saying these things about our company. Well, those, I talked to a... a uh, Talked to a guy at uh, the software company I used, used to work for, and he said, please, no more word clouds. We're over them. But for the sake of today's sermon, I made my own word cloud. This and other notes will be posted below this video on our Summerlin Church webpage. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you want the references for the scriptures, they're all over on our website um, right below. Well, I started unpacking the two sides of the will. Remember I said there was the will that was the, the human-oriented one and the will that's God-centered. And I thought, okay, I'm going to make a big word cloud. So my human-oriented word cloud that should have multiple words, words really just has one. It says trust. That's the only one I could really come up with. On the other side, though, the God-centered word cloud invites us into what's gained through wholeness, through well-being through the very essence of human salvation, through that identity of none being lost. There are no dropouts. There's none who are straying forever. This will is anchored in an eternal perspective. So from there, that's what's gained. That's absolutely what's gained. So to enter into the goodness of what's gained, I invite you to pray with me now. Your will be done. Here's how we're going to do it. If you want to take this spiritual practice with you after this video, I'm just talking about three steps. And if it helps you to make notes, you can write these down. And the hope isn't that um, these steps would just be uh, another thing to do. But this practice would actually become a life-grounded habit. And that life grounded habit would transition naturally into an authentic way of living. That you would be the kind of person who would just live your will be done. If you want to take notes with me, here are the three things. To pray this honest prayer. One, become aware of two things. First, become aware of your will. And second, Become aware of God's will. So a few moments ago, I asked you to think of something that you're ready to relinquish. In the midst of that thing, number one, identify what's your will, because you have one. We all have an attachment to what we want to see done. The first step is just to become aware of it. For so many of us, that lens of attachment is just something we look through, and we don't even see that it's an attachment that we're wearing, like we would wear a pair of glasses. Become aware of what you want. That can take time. So when you pray, your will be done, enter into this time of, what is my will? Make me aware of what my will is in this. And then secondly, say, God, what is your will in this? Open your awareness to what God has. So if that's step one, become aware of two things. Here's step two. Let go of your will as you can. One of the greatest comments I heard on the Sermon on the Mount, the prayer that Jesus gives us, the Lord's Prayer, it says, pray as you can, 
not as you can't. So don't beat yourself up for not being able to let go of what you can't let go of. Live into what you can let go of. Let go of it. Let go of your will. And then thirdly, anchor yourself to the will of God as you can, not as you can't. Another great comment I heard on the Lord's Prayer is that uh, Jesus gives us this prayer that's too big for us. We can't actually pray it ourselves. We can't, we can barely even pray your will be done. It's like an older sibling gives us a sweatshirt that they love, and it's too big for us. Jesus gives us this prayer and says, it's too big for you, but you'll grow into it. So anchor yourself to the will of God as you can, and know that you will grow into the will of God. For those of you who are uh, looking to take your prayer life deeper and further, of course there are a bunch of books out there. If you've got one that works for you, read it. That's great. If you already have prayer practices that work for you, great. Uh, this book is one that's been working for me. Joy and I have both read this book over the last couple years, and it's been the best book I've read on prayer in a long time. It's simply called How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. It's by Pete Grieg, and we'll have all the information on this below as well. Um, Pete spends a lot of time praying. He is one of the founders of a worldwide prayer movement called the 24-7 Prayer Movement. And uh, he is uh, just steeped in this stuff. And, and the guy who wrote uh, the Alpha Course, Nikki Gumbel, said, this is the book I've been waiting for. Uh, it really is good. Christianity Today is loving it. Uh, so I'm going, there's a whole chapter on the one phrase, your will be done. Uh, I'm going to end our time today reading a prayer quoted in this book. So if you'll take some time to join me in prayer. Join me in the prayer of naming something that you would like to relinquish to God. Inviting God to say, your will be done. I want you to go ahead and close your eyes if you're comfortable. It's an opportunity to lean forward into prayer. Take in a couple deep breaths. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in again, breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And choose to go deeper into this space of prayer. God, we open our hearts. Make us aware of our will. Make us aware of your will. I invite you to take time in silence to listen and reflect now. And God, equip us to let go of our will. And God, anchor us to your will. As we pray, your will be done. Guide us deeper. Take us further than we could ever know to go ourselves. And let us pray alongside this prayer from the 1600s from Francois Fellenon. Lord, I do not know what I ought to be asking of you. You are the only one who knows what I need. All I can do is present myself to you. 
Lord, I open my heart to you. I no longer have any desire other than to accomplish your will. Teach me to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in of oh, his love for me. Yes, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free. Who the sun?